Yellowstone supervolcano dynamic hydrothermal system and how they monitor this system. This is Yellowstone Caldera Chronicles latest update dated April 22nd. How can we better monitor Yellowstone's dynamic hydrothermal system? Yellowstone Caldera Chronicles weekly column written by scientists and collaborators of Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. This week's contribution is from Mike Poland, geophysicist with the U.S. Geological Survey and scientist in charge. Remember him. Mike Poland was the one that uh, said that announced that he doesn't want NASA touching Yellowstone when NASA came out with the idea that they wanted to cool the supervolcano to stop any potential eruption to mitigate it from erupting uh, into a violent uh, activity. And Poland said, no, don't touch it because it may just blow up and we'll have what we want to uh, forego sooner than later. Last week, volcano scientists gathered in Bozeman, Montana on the campus of Montana State University. The subject of the meeting, Yellowstone's hydrothermal systems. Let's remember that it was in Montana that we had the five earthquake, five magnitude earthquake that was downgraded to a, a big, big downgrade to a 4.4, even though other geological agencies have it as a 4.9 or a 5. So they were there to better monitor, to discuss how to better monitor the changes in the thermal areas of Yellowstone National Park. Let me remind you that yesterday, one of yesterday's videos, we uh, were looking at the monitoring of temperatures around the supervolcano, and uh, we were, I was, and I'm sure you were, shocked to find out that Norris Geyser Basin Steamboat Geyser has absolutely no monitoring. They say that uh, the monitor there, something, what, ha what happened to it, it, uh, it broke, it broke down, and they do not have a monitor at all monitoring the temperature of Steamboat Geyser. This was from last year. And let's remember that from March of last year, Steamboat Geyser erupted a total of about 30 times last year and at least 12 times this year, which is a huge change from what it used to erupt before that. Uh, it's seen a tremendous uptick in activity, which means that there's something very strange going on with the hydrothermal activity under Steamboat Geyser and in Norris Geyser Basin, which is also deforming and rising. Uh, I don't understand why they don't have a monitor there. It's been over a year. Uh, I'm sitting here shaking my head concerning that. Anyway, they are there discussing in Montana how to better monitor. There are good reasons for wanting to know more about how Yellowstone thermal areas work. From a public safety point of view, hydrothermal explosions, even small ones, constitute a potential hazard to visitors and park staff. The protection of Yellowstone's more than 10,000 thermal features is another motivation, ensuring that future infrastructure does not impact Yellowstone's hydrothermal heritage and requires knowledge of how thermal features change over time. Yellowstone's hot springs are also biological wonderlands and a place where geology and life intersect. They may hold clues about the origin of life on Earth. Current monitoring systems are not well suited for detecting short-term changes in Yellowstone's hydrothermal systems. In fact, there is only one seismometer located within a geyser basin. That station YNM in the Norris area, the station that best shows eruptions from steamboat geyser, only one. And they don't have a, a thermal monitor at all. Now, most seismic stations are located away from hydrothermal areas to avoid the noise, quote unquote, created by hot water moving around just beneath the surface which makes it harder to locate earthquakes in the region. Scientists also do not have a good sense for how the composition of gases and water changes over time. The chemistry Yellowstone's thermal areas has been reaching 
researched extensively over the past century, but there have been few studies that sample the same areas consistently through time. Continuous monitoring of Yellowstone's geyser basins would provide data before, during, and after interesting events. So far, scientists have been in response mode after an event takes place. We leap into action to deploy additional monitoring equipment. Data that cover the build-up to an event could be critical to forecasting future similar changes. As an example, take the Geyser Hill thermal disturbance in September 2018. A rare eruption of Ear Spring Geyser was followed by the formation of new thermal features, one that is now dormant. Scientists from a number of institutions responded replacing seismometers on Geyser Hill and collecting the other data, but by the time the equipment was in place, the action was largely over. Where, where there are measurable geophysical or geochemical precursors to the reawakening of ear spring in the formation of new features on Geyser Hill, we do not know. But imagine what might have been le learned if a, a, su a suit of seismic deformation, chemical or other measurements were being collected. The recent eruptions of Steamboat offer a similar but more promising story. No monitoring equipment except the YNM seismometer was in place near that geyser when it erupted a phase of frequent water eruptions starting March 2018. And that's the exact same situation today. It's been over a year, a year and a month, and they still don't have, uh, except for that one seismometer, anything to uh, uh, record and uh, monitor the temperature. Fortunately, steamboat eruptions persisted and scientists from Yellowstone National Park and the University of Utah deployed seismometers around the geyser in May 2018. Those instruments recorded four major steamboat eruptions before they were rec recovered in June, and the data yielded tantalizing clues that there may be precursors to steamboat eruptions. So just think, with continuous monitoring of steamboat and similar thermal features, it may one day be possible to forecast eruptions of these intermittent geysers. There are many issues to overcome before any hydrothermal monitoring system can become a reality. Operating equipment year-round in the harsh environment of the Rocky Mountains is a major challenge. In addition, data need to be available in real time, which requires radio communication. All of this work needs to be done without significant impacting the landscape or diminish the visitor experience. But uh, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory scientists are up to the task. In the coming months, they say, we will be formalizing our plans for better monitoring Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. The last time a monitoring plan was published for Yellowstone was in 2006, when Yellowstone Volcano YVO focused on establishing new seismic GPS tilt meter and strain meter stations, as well as adding additional river mount monitoring sites and conducting a survey of gas and um, water chemistry throughout the park. Many of those goals have been achieved, so it's time to focus on new tasks and unknowns. The next generation monitoring plan will address the 2020-2030 period with a focus on continuing to upgrade YVO's monitoring capability throughout the park, especially hydrothermal areas, utilizing new technology. When it's ready, we look forward to sharing that plan in the future edition of Yellowstone Caldera Chronicles, so stay tuned. Okay, I'm dismayed here uh, that there, I don't know how much money, what funding, what budgets they have. But I still do not understand why they don't have a uh, temperature monitor to gauge and, and uh, record what's going on in Steamboat at Norris Geyser Basin, the Steamboat Geyser, which has a, it's, it must be the only geyser, it's, first of all, it's the biggest geyser in the world, Steamboat Geyser. It can go up to 600 feet when it blows. The, it's the biggest geyser in the world. 
And uh, I don't understand why they don't have a, a, a monitor for the, for, for the temperature of the uh, geyser. They have it in so many other areas. Why don't they just take something from another area and put it here at steam mode geyser? Uh, because of the fact that it's too active. I mean, it's got, it's got a very rapid change in deformation and activity. That's one that I, is a big question in my mind. And the second question is they still, again, did not mention the earthquake that was downgraded to 4.4. Even to a 4.4 level, it's still big. And they have no mention of it whatsoever. And one of my uh, viewers, when that happened, told me that he knows one of the geologists in that team, YVO, out there in, in uh, Wyoming, in Yellowstone, and he was uh, in a heated discussion concerning the downgrading of this 5.0 earthquake to a 4.4, and he quit over it. He resigned because of the fact that they were hiding. They weren't uh, disclosing certain facts to people. And he, he resigned, and they weren't going to. And I see that, again, they're not mentioning it at all. Not this Caldera Chronicle and not the previous week. I'm very dismayed at that, really. So I'll leave a link below for you for this. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on, not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.